In my former book, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and to teach, until the day he was taken up to heaven after giving instructions through the Holy Spirit to the apostles he had chosen. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, whilst he was eating with them, he gave them this command, do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Then they gathered around him and asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes to you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Okay, so, Paul, we know you best as our minister Mm -hmm. here, standing at the front, Um, but you also have another role Um, perhaps more behind the scenes that we might not know so much about. Um, And I just wondered whether you could tell us a little bit more, just describe that role that you have um, with the army, um, and just perhaps um, tell us a little bit about who, describe the people that you're working with. Okay, so uh, uh, if you're a member of Emmanuel Church, you'll know clearly me as your uh, minister here. But uh, I'm also a chaplain in the army reserves to uh, a battalion called the, uh, the third, uh, third Battalion of the Princess of Wales Royal Regiment, which is based in the South East, so Sussex and Kent. Uh, they're often referred to as the Tigers because uh, years ago our, uh, our regiment got sent to India and then forgotten about. And so they were there for years and years and years before they finally got brought back to the UK again. Uh, so they're, they're affectionately known as the Tigers. So I'm, I'm wearing my uh, Tigers sweatshirt today uh, to sort of uh, identify, I suppose, as, as their chaplain. Uh, so the, 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 the battalion is an infantry battalion, so it's uh, the foot soldiers of the British Army. So they're the ones that do lots of walking, carrying stuff, uh, and, uh, and, the, uh, and, and sort of, uh, well, uh, it's infantry uh, fighting, so uh, on, on land, uh, firing at people with their, their, their weapons, no tanks, uh, no artillery, it's just the sort of, uh, it's the gun fodder of the British Army, I suppose, for want of a better term. Uh, the, the soldiers, uh, it's now mixed, it never used to be, so uh, up to fairly recently it was a, a male only uh, environment, but now the army has changed its policy, so, uh, so females can also become infantiers. Uh, and uh, so, but it's still predominantly men, predominantly young, predominantly fit, so everything really that, uh, that the church isn't. Well, I, I mean, being honest, I mean, that's, you look, I mean, just look around you. So the, the demographic is, is in its, tw- the, the large majority of them in their 20s. Uh, they've all got other jobs as well. They've all, so there's the Army Reserves, or used to be known as Territorial Army. But uh, so they're all professional soldiers in their part time and spare time. Uh, and uh, so there's, uh, and the battalion, it has, it's made up some uh, mainly infantiers, but then you also get some other. Uh, people thrown in. So we have Royal Logistics Corps who do the driving and the chefs. We've got uh, army medics and we've got clerks and then one chaplain. Brilliant. So quite a diverse um, group of people. How do you connect with your soldiers and people that you're working with in a way that actually is relevant to them when you speak about questions of faith? So I think the, the, the thing that chaplaincy does well is... Uh, well, they would refer to as incarnational ministry. You know, and if you understand the concept of the incarnation, it's, it's God coming to live with, his, with humanity. Yeah, and he, he came and, and dwelt with us, God with us. And chaplaincy would see themselves as, as an incarnational ministry. So the chaplains in the British Army have a regiment and they 
live they live with their regiment uh, in a regular army in the in the reserves when you go away on exercise you're, you're with them uh, you you're uh, you're part of them you identify with them uh, and so because of that you then because you're doing stuff together whether that's pt whether it's military exercises whether it's even things like putting up tents or washing up after the chefs have cooked and we've all eaten those sort of things you're in it together uh, and through that relationships form and often i find the conversations the best conversations you have are doing the mundane things in life you know while you're doing the washing up people are, or, or you're going on a navigation exercise and you're trying to find where you are on a map and uh, and you just have conversations and people people want to talk and they're, they're generally interested do the risk and dangers of army life influence what they want to talk about and what is it what is it that they most want to talk about yeah I, I think that is true and I think it's not just the army I think it's all three services I, I recognize we've got a, a, you know someone from the the Royal Navy here or ex-serving in the Royal Navy and, and there's this old saying that there's no atheists in, in foxholes and foxholes are when people are firing at you uh, it's the cover that you take and they it's not entirely true but that's the old saying uh, and, and I think certainly on operations and, and when I did go to Afghanistan the the reality of your of the of the fragility of life becomes perhaps a little bit more enhanced uh, and so people want to talk about some of the bigger issues of life some of the bigger questions uh, you know not necessarily why am I here but what's next? What do you think, Padre? Which is the affectionate term for the chaplains in the British Army and the Royal Air Force, not in the Navy. Uh, but uh, you know, what do you think, Padre? What do you think? Is there something beyond this? Uh, and they want to talk about some of the big issues of life. So yes, I think the the the, the intensity of especially especially operations can focus people's uh, thoughts on uh, on issues of spirituality, issues of religion, and, and what's next. Brilliant. Now, I know that you don't like particularly to be in the spotlight. No, I thought you were going to be coming up to me up there. All oh, right, I'm sorry. Um, but I'm just really grateful for you um, to be able to come up here and just to share some things with us. Because when we chat together, just in private, in conversation, I always come away so inspired. Um, and I listen to some of the things that are just going on in your daily lives, in your every day. Um, and I think a lot of faith sharing doesn't happen necessarily up front, you know, in the spotlight with a mic and a, a polished speaker, but it happens just in our ordinary everyday lives. So we're just so grateful to be able to just hear some of the things that have been going on. And I just wonder if you could share some examples of, of, of connecting with somebody and, and just tell us a little bit about what happened, what it led to. Well, I've, got, I've had to write it down, otherwise I'll be, all, be speaking all gibberish. <laughs> um, so, as you know, I do a chatty Natta cafe in Brackwisham Bay where I live for people who want to reach out and meet new people or people who are lonely. So, um, so in my chatty Natta cafe, we've got a lovely man called Ivor, and he's 93. Um, and somehow I got chatting to him, and I just I said, oh, I was at church on Sunday, and he said... Oh, he said, I used to go to church uh, when I was a little boy. He said, but he said, I wouldn't be able to get there now. And I said, well, I said, if you're interested, I said, we do a little church group at our house every other Monday. Um, I said, just let me know if you ever fancy coming along. So the next week he said, oh, I've had a thought about what you said, Anita. He said, and uh, he said, I'd quite like to come along to your little church group, if that's all right. So I told him what time it was. And so... Um, that was last year, so he, he comes every other Monday at our house, and he we're doing an alpha group, and um, I think he's a little bit sort of stuck on what the Holy Spirit is, so I said, would you like to come along to our alpha group? So he comes along to that. I think he's enjoying the food, <laughs> um, but yeah, so he's coming along to that, and, uh, and then we have... Uh, Actually, a friend of mine has come today. Two ladies from my chatty Natta group at the back there. Um, so that's not, and uh, my late my ladies curry night uh, that I do through Emmanuel. I've got a couple of um, uh, people from my chatty Natta that come along to that as well. Um, yeah, 
Um, that's that absolutely brilliant. Yeah, no, that's brilliant. I just love seeing all those connections yeah. and links, just just kind of organically growing yeah. as you, as you share your faith. Yeah. That's brilliant. Thank you. Yeah, I was just going to say. Also, I mean, yesterday I, I probably quite find it easier to talk to somebody if they're on their own. Like yesterday, I was in my lunch break and I was in the canal along the canal in Chichester. And I had a cup of tea, and there was a bench right in the sun, and there was one old elderly lady there, so I thought, oh, I'll go and sit and have my cup of tea with her. And I just got chatting to her, as I do, and uh, I said, oh, you're new to the area, and where are you from? She said, oh, I moved down four years ago. And um, I said, oh, have you made some friends since you've been down here? And she said, uh, yeah, I've made a few. And I said, oh, I said, you go, do you make... You know, a good place to make friends is going to church if you ever go to church. So, no, no, I don't go to church. So I thought, okay, well, I'll leave it there, but at least I opened up the conversation, you know, that, uh, um, yeah. And um, once you start a conversation, is it a bit less awkward than you thought it might be in maybe before you started the conversation? Or does, like, practice help make you more confident? I don't really think about it. I just, I think it just comes up in conversation, really. I don't think I'm going to ch talk church or talk about my faith to somebody. Um, but I'm sorry I keep on about the chatty natter, but it's just because I've got quite a few people there and I've been doing it for over a year. So I've got to know people and they know that I'm a Christian. And sometimes I do say, if, they're, if they've got some ill health... And I might sort of say to them, well, have you ever thought about just having a little pray? I said, if, if it's, you can't lose anything. So I don't know. Um, I, I say that sort of thing to people. Um, what else? Yeah, last week, Tony and I was in a pub in East Wittering at the Shore Pub on Friday. Was it this Friday? This Friday. And we got chatting. This lady, she'd had a couple of drinks, admittedly, but um, she was telling me that <laughs> she'd had cancer last year and she's over it now. So, and she said, oh, you know, and I said, well, I said, actually, I said, as, as I said to my husband and I, I said, as Christians, we would say, praise God, like that. <laughs> so she said, oh, and then she started having a little conversation and Tony was having a little chat with her then. Um, but yeah, so I brought that up. Just, just like that, really. Just, I, f I find that quite easy, really. But if they, if they start questioning me about the Bible, oh, what if this? Or that's when I would struggle because I don't know my Bible enough. <laughs> Help me, God. <laughs> so, and, and you've kind of already covered this, but do you ever make friends from your conversation? I think Tony was going to cover this one for me. Yes, about. <laughs> Good morning, good morning. So this was, this was covered a little already, but do you ever make friends or long-lasting relationships from these conversations? Uh, no, I don't think so. I was thinking about it this morning because Anita asked me the question in bed and she said, you know, sh shall, we, shall, we, shall we rehearse? And I said, no, I don't really want to rehearse. But, and that was one of the questions and I thought about it. I thought, I've talked to lots of people about, you know, my faith and Jesus and stuff, but I've made no friends. Probably enemies, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that's the truth. Okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah, but I think I'm answering the question. <laughs> was there something you wanted to add? Uh, there was a, a neighbour of mine, probably about 15 years ago, we lived next door to each other. Uh, Ray's his name, Ray the Rat, we called him because he was a bit of a rat and he'd always, you know, not be very good to you or kind to you and um we, we used to work with each other as well sometimes and i talked to him about the lord you know and he, he'd know that i wasn't a good christian because we, we were neighbors <laughs> so i couldn't pretend with him um and just recently he's been really sick so sick that he can't walk and and he hasn't worked for 15 months ah uh, poor Ray. anyway so I went to see him the other day and spent a couple of hours with him. Um, sorry, he's just changed for me now, just thinking about it. So uh, he showed me a video of him in the hospital and he was crying and he was in so much pain. And I saw it and I thought, wow, you know, how, how, can, I, how can I talk to him? So I just listened to him, tried to love him for a couple of hours. I brought a Bible with me in my, in my van in anticipation for seeing him because I hadn't seen him for a few years. I knew he was sick. I brought some oil as well so I could anoint him. 
in prayer, but I just, I just thought, ah, oh, what, what, what can I say? What can I do? So I said nothing and done nothing. So this is like 15 years later um, after we first became friends. So as I was going to leave, he said to me, I think God's given me a second chance. You know, and he always said, there isn't God, you're crazy, you know. And for, for years, you know, we've known each other. And he said, I think God's given me a second chance. And it was, wow, you know, God, you've just opened the door. You know, so I got to share with him, got to anoint him with oil, got to pray with him, got to give him the, give him the word. And, you know, that, that's our, after 15 years. And I just thought, you know, he's going nowhere. I'm not going nowhere, going, going nowhere with him. So, yeah, I just thought I'd, I'd share that with you. Brilliant. Thank you, Tony. Okay, you're welcome. There you go. Lee. Mm, good, yeah. I know you equally love being up front. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for doing yeah. it. Thank you yeah, for doing yeah, yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, mm. we, we talk often, when we talk about sharing faith, we talk about our community. Yeah. Um, and you've been very active in mm. your local, com local community mm. over the years. Mm. Um, I'm thinking of, for example, City Angels. Mm. That mm. Did you set up City Angels? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Set, set up City Angels. Angels. Yeah, yeah. Um, but also in your very immediate mm. local community or your, your mm. neighbourhood. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I just wondered if you could tell us a little bit, um, just share that context with yeah. us um, and just tell us how you've been sharing your faith in that, in yeah, that very context. Very much like uh, Tony and Anita, uh, like my Muslim hairdresser. I shared, uh, yes, I still do. Yeah, amazing. It still needs cutting. Um, <laughs> and he did my beard and my ear hair and that sort of stuff. Too much information. But... Um, yeah, he, we, we chatted a lot about faith, and he was uh, always stuck on uh, Trinity and uh, mer uh, grace. He got mercy, but he didn't get grace. So uh, then Jesus visited him in a dream, and uh, he said, I've got, I've got to follow Jesus, this man in white who visited me in a dream. So I led him to the Lord in Luckers Cafe on North Street, and uh, a six-foot-six white bearded ginger bloke and a Kurdish Muslim in Lucas Cafe, there was silence in the whole cafe, just checking out these two people with wide eyes panicking over cake. And um, just led him to the law because it was just natural, you know. Um, yeah, and we just, you just do that wherever, we're in Tesco's, and you just talk to someone who's in front of you in the queue and be warm and kind. And, and when Jesus is everything to you, it, it can't help but spill out. And, you know, I'm not, I'm, a, I'm broken, I'm, totally um, not qualified for telling people about Jesus, make more mistakes than the most probably, but yeah, when, when Jesus is your everything, you can't help but tell people about him, and I've never experienced anyone weirded out by it, like, not once, um, so yeah. Because that, um, that sort of covers the next question, but I was mm. going to ask how you take the first step in mm. sharing your faith and starting a conversation. So in our house church, we have a saying that is uh, love the person in front of you until they ask why. So um, it's, it's, it's kindness. And um, so our neighbours, when, you know, there's a, there was a hospital situation the other day and we just drove our neighbours to the hospital. And it's such a simple thing. But to be able to be kind first... Um, and just, just it's so simple to care, isn't it? To have other-mindedness. Um, on the days when you don't and you're hurting, that's when the Holy Spirit gets involved to, to give you the confidence or the, the other thinkingness. To, 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 and then once you're kind, people do question why. So what, why is... Why, what, and then you're like, well, I was... Yeah, a two-minute, five-minute, ten-minute testimony is another good pointer. So, depending on the situation, have a two minute, five minute, and 10 minute testimony ready. And you can say, look, uh, there was a time in my life when I didn't know Jesus, and I, was, I had all the money in the world, and all the girls, and the fast cars, and the uh, luxury apartment, and, uh, and it, but I went to bed every night with a, with a hole, like something missing in my heart. And then, I, and then you can say, and then I met Jesus. And Jesus filled that hole, that loneliness, that something that was missing in my heart. And you don't need to know all your Bible. 
you, you, just, you just talk from personal experience and no one can call you a liar from your personal experience. So, um, yeah, I guess it's that. Brilliant, thank you. Mm. And the last question is a, a bit of a tricky one, actually, in a way, but I think mm. it's um, important that we're mindful of it. Mm. When we're talking either to neighbours who mm. perhaps have got particular difficulties or needs, mm. or um, thinking of city angels, for example, mm. young people on the town at night, mm. people can be quite vulnerable in these situations. Of course, yeah. Um, how does that change your approach um, when talking about faith in people who are perhaps particularly vulnerable? Right, so if someone has had too many to drink and they are in an emergency situation, then talking about Jesus probably isn't the first move. Um, probably sorting out, sort them out. But a lot of them, you're just cleaning them up, aren't you? You know, and that's when the Holy Spirit gets involved. When... Um, when you ask Holy Spirit, show me the pain behind what's coming out. Um, when someone's going, because very often when someone's drunk, it will come out. And it won't, be, it won't be, oh, that's obvious. It'll sometimes be what they're expressing. It's behind what they're expressing. And it might be their expression, expressing aggression or, um, but if you meet that with the, when the Holy Spirit says something inside you, this is the key to unlock that. And you just can say a word. I remember um, a lad that used to come to our youth that wasn't a Christian back in Hazel, Hazelmere. And um, he, he was dark, man. Dark hood, dark clothes. He, he smelled, he was dirty. Um, and he never said anything. Just go out for cigarettes, come back into the youth thing, go out for cigarettes. And nobody could get through to him because he, he just totally unapproachable. Everything about him was go away. So I'm just sitting there, I'm like, God, God, just show me something in his heart. Show me something that's going to unlock. And I got this thing on my head. The butterfly will fly again. And this geezer is, like, there's nothing about him that looks like a beautiful butterfly. You know, you're just like, I am not walking up to this guy and saying those words. That's ridiculous. But I just knew, you know, sometimes it's not an audible voice, but sometimes you just know in your spirit, God's saying something. And I said, I won't use his name, but I said, mate, does this make any sense to you, bruv? The butterfly will fly again. He just broke down, completely broke down in tears. And obviously I'm not going to go into the details of what was going on, but the Holy Spirit giving you the triggers to be able to get past all the BS to the core of the issue uh, is the difference in this vulnerable situation after you've seen to their immediate need. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks very much. So I want to just challenge you. On your tables, you have some feet. Those feet are for you, not for the kids. Uh, and I want you to give them the thought now, because why we looked at this, we've looked at... Uh, We've looked, why we looked at the diversity of the church isn't because the church wants to s sort of celebrate the diversity for the sake of diversity. It's because that's what mission looks like. The mission is diverse. Uh, and so you, we're in the period in between Ascension and Pentecost. So Thursday was Ascension Day. And on Ascension Day, as we heard read, Jesus gathered the, his people together. And he says, right, ladies and gents, I'm going. My mission here on earth is finished. And yours is now starting. And I'm giving it to you. And he says, so Go. And he says, first go to Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And some of you are called to the ends of the earth. Some of your feet on your table are called to the ends of the earth. But some of your feet are called to Jerusalem. You know, that's the, the place where you live. That's your mission field. And some of you are called to the area you live. And some are to the call to the people down the road that maybe you don't get on with, the Samaritans. And that's your mission field. But I think, you know, we're in a church here at Emmanuel that has to rely on our networks. So we have networks, and we, we witness in different ways to different groups of people. But all of us have a role. And we're in this period between ascension when Jesus has gone back to heaven. He said, I am sending the Spirit. Wait, I am sending the Spirit. And when the Spirit comes, my church will birth. And, the, and then as the church births, it starts in this little place in the middle of nowhere on the eastern end of the Mediterranean. And look where it's spread to, to the ends of the earth. Why? Because people took seriously his charge. Go. I'm sending you out.
And, and that's the mission. So on, your, on those feet that you've got on your table, I want you to write some things down. You know, I commit to speaking to X, Y, Z. Who is it? You know, who is it that God's just laying on your heart right now? And it might be the person that you live next door. It might be a friend or a family member. It might be someone that you work with. They're the networks. And God says, go. Because as we heard, your fears don't match the reality. People are really interested in issues and matters of faith. They don't like the church very much. But they do like Christians that they know. Relationships, really, really important so who is it that you have relationships with? Write those things down. And maybe you can then use that as a bookmark in your Bible or in a book that you're reading. And then every time you open the Bible or the book that you're reading, that's there. And you go, oh, yeah, I committed to this, didn't I? And, you know, not that we're going to hold you to account. I, but, but, you know, you can do a little deal with God. I'm, I'm, I want you to help me with this. Prompt me, Lord. Who am I speaking to? Who are you calling me to speak to this week? Because the church is always on the move. It's always growing. And it's only growing because people take that seriously. And that's you and that's me. Connie.